Right. Finish what we set last week when we talked about the auditory nerve. Here I ran out of time when we were talking about the receptive fields, that's what they're called of auditory nerve fibers. You just to recap, we've got about 30,000 auditory nerve fibers each ear. Um, each of these has what's called a receptive field, that is a field of what we d differentiate in frequency and amplitude in which they respond. That's what we call frequency threshold curve or frequency threshold field. And you see the more yellow we, we have the stimulus, the more response the auditory nerve fiber shows. So black there is no response, so this, this um, nerve fiber hasn't got any spontaneous rate. And we play pure tones of very short duration at all of these frequencies and all of these amplitudes, and together they make up this nice little uh, graph, which shows us that for each frequency, and amplitude combination does our auditory nerve fiber respond. Why is that relevant? Because it tells us everything that we need to know about this auditory nerve fiber um, and, and can compare it or connect it to, the, to, the, to, to even the functional role of this, fi this fiber. So what does it characterize? First of all, the threshold. So it has a lowest amplitude at which it responds and it responds there at a certain frequency. So that's called the best frequency, in this case 2K, and at best threshold, something like 30 decibel, this one. And everything above it will respond, but only if it is within this filter shape. So this, I call that a filter shape, because it filters out everything which is black, every frequency amplitude combination that isn't in its filter shape. But you can also imagine this to be a turned around version of the traveling wave. Because only if the traveling wave reaches a certain amplitude at the site of this nerve fiber, the neuron will start to respond. And you can imagine up here, if you have very, very loud sounds, the traveling wave is so broad that it will almost mm. always lead to a response in our nerve fiber. If you are at a very quiet sound, or well, anything here, 50, 40, 30 decibel, it will only respond if it is really, if the, if the frequency of the sound, or if the sound has a frequency component which is very specialized around this uh, frequency. So that's what's, what's in electrophysiology. I just, I'm not showing that so much to illustrate how it works, but to illustrate that's what we do in electrophysiology to characterize these neurons. Why is it important? Because we know exactly what frequency we're at. Now that's what's most relevant because in electrophysiology you always need to know what, what kind of stimulus you're playing to the, to the neurons. And um, you would choose stimuli that are within its receptive field, specifically very much at the best frequency of that neuron. Okay. Just to schematically show what's, what's going on, we've got this receptive field, function of frequency and threshold. That now is a real uh, threshold curve because I, I, I simplified it by just saying that the threshold. So we respond everywhere within and not outside, but we have to go up in in, at a certain frequency, up an amplitude, up to the point where we reach the threshold. That's why it's the threshold curve, frequency threshold curve. And why do I show that? Because to illustrate what this Q value is, that's what characterizes any filter in engineering and in, 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 in the real world and audiology as well. And what we call the Q 10 dB value is the value when we divide the frequency here by the width, 10 dB above the threshold. Why is it called quality? Because the higher the quality, the narrower the filter. Okay, narrow filters are good because they can, freak, but they can select certain frequencies. Depends, I don't say good in the general sense of the word because there is no such thing as an optimum. Well, there probably is an optimum, but that optimum is not necessarily the thinnest possible uh, filters. Let me tell you a story. Um, 
the, the, these 10 dB values that we, uh, that we encounter here in humans are not lying here, something around 6 to 10. Sorry, just 6 to 10, which means you have a 6 times higher frequency than you have width here. <coughs> if you make that much, much, much smaller, so a higher frequency, every nerve fiber would be very, very specialized for a very certain frequency. That would be good in terms of frequency selectivity, but as I explained to at least one of my tutorial group, that would, what would that mean in the time domain? It would mean that in the time domain, these filters would be ringing very, very long. There's always the dichotomy between time and frequency, so the wider your filters are, the better they are to in, in time resolution, and the narrower the filters, the wider the time resolution. And for us, important is both. We've talked a lot about frequency resolution, but you also need a very, very precise time resolution. Think about binaural hearing. We haven't talked about that yet, but in binaural hearing, it turns out you can measure uh, in the range of microseconds. And if you have a microsecond uh, precision, you need filters that are actually quite broad. Otherwise, you lose the temporal precision. Okay, to, to finish the story, we're by far not the best animals to do that. There are animals, namely bats, that hear very high frequencies, and they're very specialized to frequencies at a certain range. That's their hunting frequencies, and typical example is big brown bat has 150 hertz, uh, kilohertz uh, for frequencies, and they are very, very, very narrowly tuned, because what they need to listen to is uh, the Doppler effect. So they move, compared to their wall, for example, they move, Frequency is reflected, and because of the Doppler effect, the frequency is slightly shifted that they hear back. That shift of 150 kilohertz is maybe a few hertz, but they're able to, to hear that, and they're able to negotiate where they are and where, they, where, where, where little objects like, like insects are in their vicinity. And to do that, they have filters that have a Q value of 250 to 200. So something like 20, 30 times higher, so their filters would look like very, 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 very thin lines. But they're specialized in that respect. They have what's, what's called an acoustic fovea, like our fovea in the eyes, where we have a, a, a much, much higher density of, of cones and rods. That's not true, correct me here. We only have cones on the fovea, no rods. Um, but they have a, a, an area of the basal membrane that is a much, much wider stretch, where they have a lot more hair cells and a higher sensitivity than we do. Okay, anyway. In cats, I don't have the appropriate figure for humans because I don't think anybody ever measured that because this is an invasive procedure. We, we actually measure with electrodes here in the brain, the brain stem. Uh, if you do that in the cat, you can measure a whole range of these filters as a function of frequency. So as I said, we have 30,000 of them. Here there's something like 20 of them plotted um, as a function of the sound level, characteristic frequencies, Characteristic frequency is always the, 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 top, the, the bottom bit. And you see a number of things. First of all, if you plot the um, a, a red lines under all of them, you get the threshold. So obviously, you don't have any sensitive neurons outside your hearing threshold. That wouldn't make sense, because if you had a neuron that would respond down here, then your threshold would be lower. So obviously, all of these filters need to be above threshold. They're, they're hugging the threshold closely and all of them together make the threshold. That means, in other words, it's actually philosophically sort of quite interesting. If, if, if any of these filters are active, any of our auditory nerve fibers are active, you hear a sound, which means every time there is some activity, you hear a sound. Every time there is a sound, there is an activity. That's a one-to-one -one relationship. So there will never be an activity below the threshold. Or in other words, you can use that, like in cochlear implants, if you, if you make the, an activity, that will be perceived as sound, because there's a one-to-one -one relationship between them. Anyway, the other interesting thing is what you see is that the, the filter width are wider at low frequencies than at higher frequencies. Um, that's a general rule that we talked about briefly already. And 
in humans, in cats it's a little bit higher here, so something like 6 kilohertz. In humans, this, this uh, tilt happens at around 1 kilohertz, and everything above 1 kilohertz, the filters are roughly the same width, namely about a third of an octave, or we can describe it as a Q value, it's about a Q value of 6. <coughs> Below that cutoff frequency, the Q values drop, which means the filters become wider and wider and wider. So the frequency resolution in relative terms is much worse at the low frequencies than the high frequencies. Uh, in absolute terms, of course, it's much better at the low frequencies, but that doesn't really matter. Okay. That was that. Now let's follow that auditory nerve fibers down the auditory nerve into the brain stem. Yes. So when during this quantity spiraling of this auditory nerve fibers, like how does exactly that uh, filter shapes or something like uh, what exactly happens during that specific time? During the spontaneous firing when there is no signal to send The the question is what happens during the spontaneous firing? Yeah, when you are not uh, providing any when there is no stimulus. Yeah. That has nothing to do with the, with the filter shapes. The filter shapes are a function of the response of the neuron to external sounds. If, they do have, if you do have a spontaneous rate, um, it would show up in the, in the frequency threshold curves as activity outside here. It's noise. It's basically noise. It's background noise. And in fact, I wasn't quite saying the truth because there is activity in auditory nerve fibers which doesn't lead to a perception, namely the spontaneous activity. It just shifts our working point practically a little bit upwards and uh, we don't perceive that as a sound. Some people argue that you do perceive that as a sound and if actually challenge you if you're in a very quiet room, go into our soundproof chamber downstairs in, in the, in the um, next door in the relay building and if it's the quietest room you've ever been in and you, you sit there for five minutes you will hear stuff. <laughs> there is a lot of activity in your ears when there is no activity outside. The ear makes up for that. Um, I'm not quite sure where that comes from. You could argue that is actually spontaneous activity that you hear, which is so low that you usually never ever hear it, but you could argue that it is sort of a spontaneous activity. But what you also hear is the blood flow in your ear, and um, that, that is loud enough to, to be actually perceivable then. So there is no su such thing as absolute quietness. Okay, we learn about the auditory brainstem and the afferent and efferent auditory pathway. First of all, a tiny little bit of anatomy, um, namely all of the words or the, the, the description of, of, of anatomic structures that we learn have a certain code that is easy to, um, to, to, to understand if you just know the language. And this is just the, the, the dictionary that I give you. This is a human brain. And the, the directions that we, that we call here is rostral caudal, dorsal ventral. Um, you probably have heard of them. Ventral means towards the belly. Caudal means towards the, the tail. The human is a little bit special in that respect because our brain is tilted by 90 degrees. Any other, because we're walking upright, any other mammal, well, walks on all four, um, looks forward, obviously, so the whole thing is, 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 is tilted by 90 degrees. So the human is the odd one out. So rostral is towards the nose. And usually this is forward. In our case, well, it's still forward, um, but. Um, yeah, you can imagine it's just turned around. Dorsal top, caudal back, ventral down. And if you look from, from behind, you've got lateral and medial. So medial towards the midline, lateral off the midline. And these are some words that are useful to know. So ventral towards the belly of the body, dorsal towards the back, rostral towards the nose, caudal towards the tail. These are the, uh, the, 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 um, the one way to name it, the other way is anterior or posterior. Anterior or posterior, inferior or superior is always in relationship to something else. So we have an anterior part of the cochlear nucleus as opposed to the posterior part. Uh, that's, we use different of saying we have a rostral part or a caudal part, but that's just the direction. The, the anterior posterior is in relationship to something else lateral, medial, um, just here to, to, to bilateral, ipsilateral, contralateral, 
there's the definitions. Let me not only use that in psychophysics, also in anatomy. Um, bilaterals sat on both sides of the body, ipsilateral on the same side of the body, uh, contralateral on the opposite side of the body. We need that when we follow the auditory nerve. Okay, we also have um, the, the, the habit to cut animals into planes, and these are the, the planes that we usually use, dorsal plane, sagittal plane, and transverse plane. There is no logic to that that I can distinguish, but you, you, you can remember them, well, you have to remember them when we talk about brain slices. Okay. Right. Here's a brief overview. We will going to follow this week and next week um, the auditory nerve, the, the auditory pathway, the afferent auditory pathway specifically, which goes from the cochlea, so the auditory nerve comes out here in green, into what's called the cochlear nuclei and superior oliv olivary complexes down there. And actually, the, the auditory nerve fibers end here into the inferior colliculus, into the midbrain, the me medial geniculate body, and then left and right auditory cortex. Don't worry about the, the details here. We'll come to the details in a little bit more. Um, detail later on. This is just an overview and I'll put that up here because I like the, 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 this very, very rough um, schematic overview of saying what's happening on the brainstem is analysis and what happens on the cortex is interpretation. Um, that, of course, is not true, but it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a, as good a lie as any to understand and to, to remember what's actually going on. You, you see that the cortex is, I don't know how much, 50, 100 times larger than the, than the brainstem. Um, but it turns out for us, the brainstem is by far the most important structure to understand and to, um, to need for hearing. Um, well you can hear without a cortex. You can hear without interpretation. You, you can see without a cortex as well. I don't know if you, if you know these stories or have read um, Oliver Sacks. He's got amazing stories about people with brain injuries. But it, it turns out it's not quite clear what the cortex actually is doing. We'll, we'll have a whole lecture on the cortex and what, what, what it is actually doing. But the, the take-home message is, um, well, some of the, the brainstem physiologists say that the, role, the primary role of the cortex is to keep the brainstem warm um, because it's very difficult to find out what's actually specifically doing when it's not there. Um, so, in fact, if, 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 if you only had, were left with your, with your midbrain or your, even your brainstem, you would function quite well in terms of hearing. You wouldn't understand language, but you would quite hear a lot of things which makes sense, evolutionary, because many animals don't have a cortex and they still hear a lot. So this is following quite an evolutionary pathway. Um, we're going from the cochlea, something happens in the brain, obviously, in the brain stem, and then um, there are animals that only, only go up to this level, but they do have ears and they do hear, and, and they do hear binaural things, and they communicate even. And then we go higher in ferricolliculus, MGB, the, 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 brains, the, the midbrain, and there are animals that stop here, that would be um, um, toads, for example, or frogs. They, they, don't, go, they don't have to, uh, auditory cortices. Um, and then we have any degree of, of, of animal with, with, with the size of the auditory cortex, human at the top of them. And our auditory cortexes are quite large compared to any other animal because we're so specialized in uh, communication, of course. Anyway, that wasn't a brief overview, that was a long overview. Let's go to details, what the brainstem is, okay? It's a sagittal view of the, uh, of the human head. Cerebrum, another word for cerebellum or for the cortex. Corpus callosum, thalamus in there. Pons, cerebellum, medulla oblongata, spinal cord. Spinal cord comes up from the, from the, from the, from the back, obviously, and it goes into what's called this medulla oblongata and the pons. The pons is the bridge-like structure. The pons, you can't see that in this two-dimensional structure. The pons is the structure that connects the left and the right, right brain. That's where, 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 most of the, um, where most of the nerve ends and distribute across 
the, the, the rest of the brain. It serves as a relay station from the medulla to the higher cortical structure. It contains the respiratory centers. The, if you look th through a microscope on the pons and the medulla obligata, um, you don't see very much. There's a high, very high density of neurons without much structure. If you look at the spinal cord, there's not much going on. These are mostly nerves. But they project into the medulla obligata and the pons, and from there they project further on. So th you see there's a lot of structure in the cerebrum and the cortex, but not much in the pons. This, again, is an evolutionary thing. Um, practically any animal any vertebrate on this planet has a pons and a medulla oblongata and this is the oldest part, by far the oldest part of the brain and it is so old, so special, no, not so specialized, but it is specialized, so um, developed that it, it has given up any kind of structuring inside. So it's really, really hard to say what's actually going on. You can, you can identify individual neurons that are, for example, responsible for a respiratory center or for your heartbeat and, and for your liver function and stuff like that. So the very, very bodily functions are in there. So if you have any kind of damage to your, to your brainstem, medulla oblongata, you're basically dead. You, you, you can't replace any of these functions. You can replace any function in the cortex. If you lose a big chunk of your cortex, that's not dramatic. Other parts of the cortex can take over, but not of the midbrain and the, the brainstem. Yes, medulla oblongata functions primarily as a relay station for the crossing of the motor tracts. Also contains respiratory, vasomotor, cardiac centers, blah, 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 reflex activities, coughing, gagging, swallowing, vomiting. So all the very, very basic functions are down there. The midbrain serves as nerve pathway to the cerebral and it contains auditory visual reflex center. That's a bit broad. The mid, that's not the hypothalamus, that's not the midbrain. The midbrain sits between the pons and the thalamus up here. That's what we call the, 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 the midbrain. Here you see it better. The hypothalamus is something completely different. Um, that serves as a relay station and we have a midbrain for us in the, in the auditory world is important because all the auditory signals go straight through the midbrain where they are, um, where they do functions like attention and memory. Um, and the visual centers in there as well are connected to the auditory centers. This is where, where the, a lot of auditory stuff happens. Okay, just to get you up to speed for your pop quiz knowledge, general knowledge, that's not <laughs> auditory specific, the cranial nerves. <coughs> Somebody knows the, what they're saying of how to remember them all? I can never remember, not in English at least. No? Yeah? Say it. That's, uh, we can say it in English, but that's different. In Indian. <laughs> say it in Indian. To follow the ability. It's a long time ago. Okay, whatever. There are, there are a number of ways, and there are on Wikipedia, you can look them up. So this is to, to remember these 1, 2, 3, 4, up to, to 12. Um, I'm not making much point of that. I'm just saying the auditory nerve, where is it? Oculomotor, cranial, facial, that one here. Yeah. That's the vestibular cord there. Quite slam bang in the middle, and very, very close to the facial nerve as well, which is a problem, by the way, for... Uh, for surgery, for, for um, cochlear implant surgery. The, the biggest danger in, in, in cochlear implant surgery is that you hit the, the facial nerve, which r runs right um, through, not right through, but very, very close to the, um, the opening, the inner, the, the, the inner, the middle ear opening. Um, and so you have to be very careful with that. Anyway, vestibular ochlea goes right here into the brainstem, like all the other nerves as well. Okay. Right, here's a simplified overview. And if there was a, an exam, and there used to be in past times, the exam question was pretty much always draw a simplified function of the auditory system, of the affer afferent auditory pathway. This is how you would draw it. You would start at the cochlea, goes to the cochlear nucleus, superior olivary complexes, auditory auditory thalamus, and cortex. And we've got the midline here, 
which means this is the left side of the brain or the ipsilateral side and this is the contralateral side. But luckily you don't have to do an exam but you should still know it. And we go now through, through all of these different stations and um, illustrate some of what we know about them. Starting with the auditory nerve, we talked about that last week. Okay, how do we know these things? We're talking about anatomy here. We're talking about two things. We're talking about anatomy, namely the connections and where they are, and what they are. And we're talking about physiology, which I always find slightly more interesting. What's actually happening in there, and why do we have these things, and what are they doing? But anatomically, how do we know these connections? It's a painstaking process, and most of this knowledge has been done with, with well, in the olden days, 50s, 60s, with... Uh, a tracer, which is called horse radish peroxidase, called retrograde tracing. What you do is you inject a, a, uh, a tracer, which is based literally on horse radish. Um, you you in, inject that into a specific brain area, like for example, you inject it somewhere over there, and then it, it, it enters the axons at the terminals, and over a couple of uh, hours to days, it will wander all the way through the axon into the cell body and uh, stain that as well. What does stain mean? Stain means you can actually then treat it with the chemical, and I forgot what the actual chemical is, uh, so that you can, that it makes a contrast on the microscope. If you look through a microscope, usually you don't see anything. You see a gibberish mask of, 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 of um, cell bodies and axons, but you can't make any sense of that. And that was the big thing that already in the 19th century it started of people actually plotting out the connections. Um, Kayal was the, 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 the great guy there who did a lot of the work in the cortex. The problem with that is, uh, you see, that this is the brain stem here, up to the midbrain. This is something like a centimeter from there to there, I think. I mean, we're talking guinea pigs here usually. This is, again, a very invasive procedure. And you, you can do that how many times per animal? Exactly one. So you get, if you're lucky, one of these traces per one animal. So you see how, how expensive that is, and nobody wants to do these experiments, certainly not nowadays anymore. Uh, but we still rely on, these, on, these, um, on this knowledge. Right, anyway, what I want to say is, this is the centimeter. If you look through it under the microscope, you see maybe something like the size of my of the laser pointer here. And then how do you follow this axon through there? Especially since you're working in a slice, which means a slice cuts the three-dimensional brain into two dimensions. So you, you're practically guaranteed that there never is a chance that you have the whole of the axon within one slice. So you will always you have to go through various slice, slices so here you're going not only down, but you're also going up, or maybe the axon does, does S's or what, what. So it's impossible to find, without really good tricks, to find the actual connections between them. You can't do it electrically. That's even more difficult because, well, you could. You could argue stick an electrode in here and an electrode in there, uh, and you, you stimulate that part of the neuron, and you measure this is where it's coming out. And... Believe me, people have tried for years and years, and I have done, I've tried that with, with, with multi-electrode systems, but there has never been a case where we actually recorded uh, a, a, a neuron up there when we stimulated it down there. This is, because there are millions and millions of them, the chances that you actually get them are nil. No. Anyway, the best way to do that is, is tracing. So you in inject the tracer up here, you wait a few days, um, and then you, you cut the, the, the animal in, in slices, brain, not the animal, uh, and you go through each of the slices and you find where these traces are and then you, you put them all together again and you get one of these lines. So you can imagine th 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 these are colored um, for purposes of, of saying these are different connections. So this was one animal, one animal, one animal and so on. And, and so you get uh, slowly and slowly you get a picture of where the main connections go. Okay, these are, I don't know, 10 out of 50 million or something that are actually there. But there are, um, um, what's the word, um, representative for the majority of these connections. There are many more connections in there, of course. Many connections within there and within there, but these are the ones that we know or suspect very highly are the ones that are relevant for the, um, for the hearing process. 
Okay. So, what we know is that the cochlea projects the, the auditory nerve into the cochlear nucleus. And I know a lot about the cochlear nucleus because this is where, where I did uh, measurements. This is the auditory nerve. And it projects here into the epsilateral cochlear nucleus, of course, on the other side as well. Cochlear nucleus is about, well, about that size here, or that size there. Cochlear nucleus is what we call the first relay station in the auditory system. So all auditory nerve fibers project into the cochlear nucleus, which means that all the activity in the cochlear nucleus is perceived as sound. And again, the other way around, every activity that you can get into the cochlear nucleus is actually perceived as sound, which brings you to, if you heard of brainstem implants? That's the step further from cochlear implants. A cochlear implant, you put an electrode up here and stimulate the auditory nerve. If, if for some reason the, the, the auditory nerve is damaged, um, cancer or something, you can still implant an electrode or a, an array of electrodes into the cochlear nucleus. That's what the brainstem implant does. That it stimulates neurons directly in the cochlear nucleus. Not very successfully, one must say, because we basically don't really know how to stimulate them. So that makes sense, but at least there is some um, sort of sound perception coming through, and people can help can be helped understanding language. They will never be as good as cochlear implant subjects, uh, but they, they, they will get some benefit out of them. There are not many of them. There are a whole of the UK, I think there are about 80 or 90 people with a brainstem implant, but nevertheless. Even they say that cochlear implants are more useful than brainstem implants in auditory implants. Yes. Because uh, like in implants, like because of the wider, uh, so they, they can only perceive the sound. So, uh, even are more than yes, the, the, there is a lot of problems with auditory brainstem implants. I don't want to go into detail with them. The, the, they start with um, we, we don't have any frequency resolution with them. We we don't know as good how the frequency resolution of the of the of the brainstem is. Uh, we do it much better in the cochlea because it's just curling up. So we, we can't really split the signal into the relevant parts at different frequencies. Um, while we're there, I'm, I'm, I'm running over time here, but it doesn't matter. Um, there is also, the, the difficulty is obviously that it's much harder to get to the, to the brainstem um, um, in, in terms of procedure than into the ear, because you can into get into the ear very easily, straight through the ear. So you need to have real brain surgery to put an electrode up there. Um, even even more difficult, there are some people running around the planet who have an, an, a midbrain implant, which is sitting on the inferior colliculus up there. I think it's about three or four, they're all in Italy, because there's a mad professor who's ap apparently got ethical approval for that. Um, but th th these people, are, they do a little bit of benefit, but really not very much, so I don't think there's much future in, 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 in that idea. Sorry, say that again? Yes. The, the, the whole idea is that, that if you have a damage, a tumor in the, in the cochlear nucleus, then you, you, you haven't got a chance to do there anything, and so you, you go steps higher. But because of the processing, just to take forward everything that I want to say, the, the take-home message, processing becomes more and more complicated. We pretty much understand what the auditory nerve is doing with the stimulus. So these frequency threshold fields that I showed you, they basically explain what we need to know. We can stimulate it exactly the way that they're stimulated by sound. We can do that artificially. We can take away the basal membrane, replace it with a an, with an piece of electronics, with a, with a filter array, and we can stimulate the nerves in the way that, they, that they're stimulated by the basal membrane, and that's what's perceived then as sound for the cochlear implantees. That's why we have 600, 700 patients here in the clinic. Um, but the, the higher we go up, the less we understand what the processing actually is. We have a rough understanding of the cochlear nucleus. Uh, we have basically no real understanding of what's going up higher. And if we go to the cortex, we're just completely swimming. But it's good. There's lots of research to be done. Um, and there will be certainly big um, advances in the next 10, 20 years, I, 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 I am sure, because the techniques become better, computers become better, that all helps.
Anyway. Cochlear nucleus is only ipsilateral. There is no binaural processing. Um, yeah, that's a good lie, but <laughs> there always is some binaural processing, but there are 99% of the, of the, of the nerve fibers go ipsilaterally and not contralaterally. And what I say here, the, the, what, what it's doing, what's called simple auditory processing um, in the cochlear nucleus, as a, as just as an idea of what it's doing, sharpening of frequencies, um, which means you have neurons not only respond to one nerve fiber, they also respond to various nerve fibers left and right, so lower frequencies, higher frequencies, so they can sharpen frequencies a little bit, they can be get a better frequency resolution. They can detect temporal onsets and offsets, so they're sensitive to temporal changes in the signal. What the auditory nerve fiber isn't, they just respond mechanically, if you like, to the sound. They can detect thresholds, they're very, very simple building blocks of sounds. They are represented and they are detected in the cochlear nucleus. Right, a little bit about anatomy of the CN. I call it CN from now on, it's easier. It spans the junction of pons and medulla. We saw. It receives mainly ipsilateral efferent input. Afferent here, just to remind you, that's all coming from the hair cells. We're not talking about efferences here so far. We have two distinct anatomical divisions, namely the ventral and the dorsal part. The ventral is further split into anterior and posterior. And the, the VCN, the ventral cochlear nucleus, projects further on to the superior olivary complexes. That will become important later on because this is where all the, the re relevant information about hearing actually goes. This is where the, the main pathway is. Whereas the dorsal cochlear nucleus projects uh, further onto the contralateral IC um, and treat that with, a, with, with caution because we don't really know what the human dorsal cochlear nucleus does. We have a quite good idea what it does in cats. Namely, it's responsible for cats moving their ears into the right direction. Um, because what it does is can, it can filter certain frequencies and respond to these frequencies and, and has actual muscle outputs. Whereas the, the human DCN is obviously not, not doing exactly the same, but honestly we have no idea what it is doing otherwise. That's a problem with humans. We can't do proper experiments with them. We can do anatomy, they're dead, but we can't do any physiology. So we have to transfer from animals. Right, curly bracket open, I want to talk to you about tonotopy um, because this is something that we encounter all over the auditory pathway from the auditory nerve, from the cochlea in fact, uh, up to the cortex. Tonotopy is a, is, a, is, a, is a word for the spatial arrangement of where sound is perceived, transmitted or received. It means it refers to the fact that tones close to each other in terms of frequency are represented in topological neighborhood neurons in the brain. Okay, what does it mean? It means on the cochlea, we all know that, frequencies are ordered from high to low, which means there's a neighborhood relationship or a topology, which means if you are a thousand hertz neuron, then the neighboring neuron will be close to thousand. There will be not a six thousand hertz, but it will be ordered. And this order is preserved throughout the auditory pathway. So even if you have the, the nerves, you would imagine that the nerves go out of the medulla of the, 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 the cochlea um, into the, 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 the nerve and into the brain and somehow they're all mixed up. But that's not the case. They are still nicely ordered. If you go to the, um, to the, to the ventral, uh, the, the cochlear nucleus, I'll show it to you in a second, do you find that they are still ordered nicely from low frequencies to high frequencies and are arranged? Okay, this basically reflects the tonotopic organization of the cochlea. Another word for that is cochleotopic uh, because it is as on the cochlea organized. Tonotopy is closely related to the place theory, to, of which we will hear next week, because it's a way of, of us understanding how our frequency perception actually works. Okay, here's an, 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 an illustration of that. That's the whole ventral cochlear nucleus of a guinea pig. 
And the guinea pig, the, the DCN is actually part of the cochlear nucleus, so we really have a, a, a ventral part of the cochlear nucleus and the dorsal part of the cochlear nucleus. Uh, in the human, there's a separation between these two. They're actually like a few millimeters apart. But what I'm pointing out here is, yes, here, I've got three auditory nerve fibers coming in, and they were traced. Here's one. Um, it's a low frequency, 170 hertz. Uh, it, it then branches once into the AVCN, one in the PVCN, that's what they all do. And then they have a second one that was found at, at 2.7 kilohertz, and it branches over here. And a third it branches over there. Now, if you were, that's the point that I want to make, if you, if you were to stick a needle, say in here, an electrode, and you measure your best frequencies, you would start at the low frequencies, higher frequencies, high frequencies, and so on. The same is true here. You start low frequencies, high frequencies, and so on. It gets confusing, of course. You choose the wrong <coughs> angle, like that, because you get up and down again, because you're effectively in two different uh, branches. That's why they are called two different uh, brainstem areas, although the, the differentiation is quite... Um, quite Small. I mean, this is this is only like half a it's one, cent, one one millimeter. The whole thing is maybe five millimeter. But we we separate it into this anterior part and posterior part because both of them do have a tonotopic representation. So everything that has a tonotopic representation is automatically called a brain area that is connected to sound perception, uh, and it does sound processing. Oh yeah, put a fourth one in there. Yeah, 36. That's how you see that we are in a guinea pig because humans wouldn't have 36 kilohertz, obviously. Good. Right, a little bit more about the cochlear nucleus, specifically the VCN, ventral cochlear nucleus, because I spent five years bloody working on that, so you might as well suffer a little bit too. So what we do is we put electrodes into them, I had this picture up last week already, and you, you, we, we, we call these neurons differently depending on what they look under the microscope. These are multipolar cells, spherical cells, globular cells, octopus cells. And um, the, the interesting thing on the next three slides is that I show different responses. So if you were to look at the PSTA, it's a post-stimulus time histogram of an auditory nerve fiber. I showed you one last week. It looks pretty much like that one. You always use that uh, to display the response of the neuron in response to a 50 millisecond tone burst of a frequency at its best frequency. So it responds very much at the beginning and then it, uh, um, it attenuates, so it, it, it adapts to the stimulus. Uh, if you switch the sound off, it, it stays off. This one hasn't got any spontaneous rate, but it doesn't matter. It is pretty typical for what's called uh, that's why it's called primary like. So this is not the auditory nerve fiber. It's an elect a, a neuron which sits where the auditory nerve fibers terminate, and the neurons respond pretty much exactly the same way as the auditory nerve fibers. So they are really just transmitting more or less the information that the auditory nerve has into a neuron, and that projects it in terms higher up somewhere else in the brain. They are, because they are just reflecting what the auditory nerve does, they are temporarily very precise and therefore useful, for example, for binaural processing, where we need to have the, the highest temporal precision. Okay, if we stick our electrode into a different area, like that one, spherical, we, we, res we get subtle differences in our responses. Namely, remember this is 250 times the, uh, uh, the, the same stimulus, if you listen to that, you would always hear a click, 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 click. So they, they always respond very regular to the sound. That's what's called the chopping behavior. These are really, really, really bad in measuring temporal effects because they basically, they just, as soon as there is a sound, they will respond happily away and they're not useful for doing binaural processing or temporal, um, mm. any processing that needs temporal precision, but they're very good at measuring the amplitude of sound, as we know. because we can measure, we can count how many of these spikes we get, how many of these um, chops we get, and that tells us very nicely how many uh, decibel our sound has. Um, 
you just have to believe me that I'm not getting into detail with that. That would that would take us much, much, much too long. I'm just saying that to, to showing that to illustrate to you that neurons work completely different. There's another one that we find um, in, in the globular area here, or in the octopus area, which only responds at the beginning of the sound, and then it does respond a tiny little bit, but not nearly as much as at the beginning. What are these useful for? They are useful for temporal processing because they, um, they, they, can, they are very sensitive to change in the stimulus when the sound is switched on, namely there, but then they don't give as much information after that anymore. So they're good for changes in sound. Um, the other ones are good for the overall sound energy. These ones are good for time, the other ones better for frequency. So the neurons obviously, depending on where you are, split the workload of temporal and frequency analysis and all of the neurons do a little bit something different in that. That's where we are. Okay. Good. And we're running out of time. So I stop the lecture here and we carry on next week and we go up further up the auditory pathway. Thank you. <coughs>